We're just going to grab some announcements now. Next Sunday and then Monday and Tuesday after that, we're going to be having prayer meetings here. So I want to invite you to come and pray with us corporately. Corporate prayer is very important. Corporate prayer makes a difference. And we know that the Bible says that when the righteous pray, when a righteous man prays, God hears and it makes a difference. Amen? Amen. I'm starting to sound like the Message Bible with my own paraphrase of everything. But I want to invite you next Sunday and then Monday and Tuesday. So whether you can come for one night, two nights or all three nights, whatever you can do, I want you to come, please. I'm inviting you to come and be part of it. Also, you'll see the cards on the seat. Please let us know your prayer requests. We do pray for all the prayer requests on all three nights. So grab those and please pass them to myself or to Christina at the end of the service and then we will keep them and we will be praying for you. Ladies, Fiona Butler is coming with an amazing, amazing testimony. So we're going to have a beautiful afternoon tea. We're going to hear from Fiona. So let me know if you're able to come and be part of that on the 18th of September. The 18th of September at 2pm. Wow. Gifts for me, I think. Okay, there's a men's conference coming. It's up at Ipswich. It's called The Company. So please let Pastor Randall know if you're able to come. That's Saturday, 8th of October. And I want to invite you all to be part of our connect groups. They happen every week. It's wonderful to connect with others during the week, either by Zoom or in person, whatever suits you the best. Um, and we say thank you every week and we'll continue to say thank you for your faithful giving. Church, it's amazing what we're able to do because of your giving. And um, if you're watching us online, I want to invite you to get in touch with us, to keep in touch. Uh, have, a, have a look on our website, on our Facebook. And if you want to, if you have any questions about Christianity, about Jesus, anything about the church, we'd love you to come and we'd be more than happy to connect with you. Amen? Amen. Okay, we've got a special thing happening now. Um, we've got some men who are organised to come and tell us some dad jokes. So if the men bringing dad jokes would come onto the platform uh, with me, come and stand alongside me. Yes, all of you who have been asked to bring dad jokes. So church, right at the start, I want to apologise to you for what you're about to hear. Okay. Please come and line up, guys. Don't be shy. As Paul says, let, let, let us not be amongst those who shrink back. So let's all come here. All right. Are we ready? Is, uh, hmm? Who wants to volunteer to go first, I guess, is the uh, question. Who, who has the best joke, do they think? Matthew's been pointed, Matthew, Matthew's been pointed out, so I'm going to go with Matthew. Okay, so <laughs> church, a big cheer if you like the joke. Try not to groan too loudly. Hi. Oh, they've got that. Just checking that this is on. Um, yeah, who's on the sound desk today? Oh, thank you. Um, I didn't actually think I had any bad jokes, and then I asked my students, and then they had a long list. So um, there's always one that happens every year. It's when it gets to summer, it's really hot, and the kids say, this, is, this, uh, this room is so warm. And I say, if you were more famous, we'd have more fans. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Thank you. I'm oh, sorry. Who's next? Who's next? I can, you're up. You're up. First shall be last. Well, have you heard of the bungee jumping business that wasn't doing good at all? So the owner decided on an advertising campaign to heavily discount the jumps. So out came a banner that read 95% discount on all rides, uh, on all jumps. Sorry. And there are no strings attached. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> what did the ocean say to the beach? Nothing. It just waved. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just glad they set this mic up for me. <laughs> As you know, I love to sing. And um, I love to sing in the shower. And, um, but sometimes, you know, I get body wash in my mouth and it turns into a soap opera. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa! Now the question.
course, you saved the best till last, which is me. Uh, I can't get the opportunity not to tell a joke. It's actually, I did this joke to my children to test it before I give it to you, and uh, Charlie groaned, and she's even hiding her face as we speak. Uh, my joke is actually special because it's on topic, because I'm talking about Daniel today, Daniel and Darius. King Darius, you threw Daniel in the lion's den. We know that story, yeah? And so we have Daniel and Darius. And what was the first thing that Daniel said when he came out of the lion's den? He said, where's the king? Oh, Darius. I'm here all week. <laughs> Excellent. So happy Father's Day, everyone. Uh, when I came in this morning, Pastor Jim was like, happy Father's Day. Did you get breakfast in bed? And my first reaction is always, ooh, that's gross. I cannot eat in bed. If, am I the only person? Who, who can't eat in bed? I can't eat in bed. No way. It's, it's disgusting. I'm sorry. I can't do that. But what did happen is that my children come in and they jump all over me and they squash me, which is great. And they give me all their presents, which is awesome. I'm wearing some this morning, some socks. Um, contrary to popular opinion, I actually really go, like getting socks because I like to change them over. I have socks with cool patterns on them. So these have otters on them. So excellent. So welcome this morning on this wonderful Father's Day. And I've got a message for you this morning that I've entitled A Cut Above. You probably heard the phrase, A Cut Above the Rest. It's a popular term. And uh, traditionally, that term, A Cut Above the Rest, was in order to identify something or someone that was more superior, had better quality than those around it. But for our purposes this morning, that's not what I want to do. That's not what I, how I want to use the phrase this morning. I'm not interested in placing people above or below other people. Amen? I'm not going to do that. So this Father's Day, I'm going to talk about being a cut above in reference to each of us individually seeking and striving to be our best. In terms of in our behavior, our words, our thoughts, our attitudes, we aim to be a cut above what we have previously shown in our lives. Up to this point, we have been representing God. We've been living our lives in a godly way, reflecting Jesus Christ. And being a cut above is to go extra. It's to go the extra mile because we want to grow in our faith. We want to become better, better disciples of Jesus. And so we want to display a better quality of example for those around us, don't we? And we want to represent our God more accurately and more genuinely than we have so far. So we're going to aim to be a cut above this morning. And even though it's Father's Day, traditionally we speak to the men in the church, there's nothing in this message that is only for the dads, only for the men. Everything I say this morning will be for everyone listening and everyone at home watching. Because we all aim to be our best, don't we? We don't aim to be the same. We don't aim to be worse, certainly. We aim to be better, and we should aim to be better, and we should aim to be cut above in our faith, to try and stay sharp in all that we do and say so we can be an example for those that we love and influence. So where do we start then? Where do we start? We need an example, don't we? We need an example of someone who can show us how to be a cut above. And it's no secret this morning from my awesome joke that I invented myself, just to put that out there, that Daniel is going to be our example this morning. And we're going to look at the life of Daniel and specifically Daniel's experience with the den of lions. His experience and his relationship with King Darius and how that happened and what happened in that event in his life. We're going to see how they behaved, how they spoke, how they responded and the choices they made. And from them we're going to learn to how to be a cut above in our walk with Jesus. So today we're looking at the life of Daniel and I thought I'd familiarize you again with the story of Daniel and the den of lions in case you've forgotten what happened. But we're going to do it a little bit differently. I haven't used this book in quite some time. It's been years since I've read from this book. Written by a man called Cameron Simmons, a friend of Natalie's who's here somewhere this morning. And he decided to take 26 tales of our Bible and put them into alliterative poems. Okay? So we have Darius and Daniel. So, of course, our letter for today is D. Okay? I feel like I'm on Sesame Street. It's all right. Okay? So we're going to look at the story of Daniel, or as Cameron Simmons has put it, Devout dignitary defies death in den of dangerous devourers. Okay, with me so far? Okay, excellent. Daniel was a dignitary in the domain of Darius, and Daniel was dear to Darius due to his downright dependability. But dozens of dignitaries in the domain despised Daniel's dedication to disallowing dishonesty. Determined to destroy Daniel, some devious diplomats discerned that Daniel dialogued with his deity dusk and dawn daily. Deviously, the diplomats deceived Darius in declaring a decree disallowing daily discourse with any deity. Even Darius didn't deny a decree since once it's documented. 
In due course, the devious diplomats declared the discovery of Daniel in dialogue with his deity. Darius was distraught, doomed by his own decree. At dusk, Daniel was detained and dropped deep down into a den of dangerous devourers. Darius was devastated. The diplomats were delighted, but Daniel was devout. And dramatically, the dangerous devourers draped drowsily in the den, disinterested in Daniel as a dinner. Divine deputies had dried their drooling dental daggers and disturbed their digestion, delivering Daniel from a disgusting death. Hurrah! At dawn, Daniel da dashed to the den and declared defeatedly, Daniel, Daniel, Darius, Daniel, did you defy death? I did, Darius, I did. Did your deity deliver you, Daniel? He did, Darius, he did. Darius was delighted and danced and danced and danced. Darius demanded Daniel to be drawn from the den and denounced the devious diplomats, damning them to death. Darius declared Daniel's deity the definitive deity. And Daniel diligently did his duties in the domain of Darius, daily declaring the downright dominance of the divine deliverer. Amen. Amen. So we're looking at the life of Daniel, one particular event in his life. And whether you read the Bible growing up, whether you grew up in church or not, we've all heard about Daniel and the lion's den. It's one of those stories that you know, like Jonah and the whale. We know the story. There's children's books about it. They write poems about it. But before we get into the story, we're going to get some understanding about Daniel's life up to this point. How did he get to this point in his life? Daniel was born in Jerusalem in the region of Judea uh, as a young man. In about 605 BC, the Babylonians, the Babylonians came in and they conquered Jerusalem and Judea. They came in and took out God's people. And King Nebuchadnezzar, as he did when he conquered a new land, he would take all the intelligent, strong, promising young men and he will pluck them captive, kidnap them, and take them to his capital, Babylon, hundreds of kilometers away, and he would train them. He would take their identity away, he would give them a new name, and they will be trained how to serve their new kingdom, how to serve their new government. And so Daniel was a teenager when he was taken away, and he served this kingdom his whole life over different kings. Then the Babylonians were overthrown by the Medo-Persian Empire. They came in and defeated the Babylons. And this new king, King Darius, the Mede king, took over Babylon, took over all the men there. And at this stage, Daniel is late 70s, early 80s. So any image you have in your mind of a young Daniel being thrown into the lion's den, get rid of it. He is an old man. He is 80, around 80 years old when he gets thrown into the lion's den. He has served this foreign kingdom, two different kingdoms, two different empires for over 60 years. And now we pick up the events of Daniel. Daniel's life. So I'm going to read to you from the actual Bible, not my little wonderful book here. I'm going to look at this story, Daniel 6, 1 to 5. Darius the Mede decided to divide the kingdom into 120 provinces. He appointed a higher officer to rule over each province. The king also chose Daniel and two others as administrators to supervise the half and protect the king's interests. Daniel soon proved himself more capable than all the other administrators and high officers. Because of Daniel's great ability, the king made plans to place him over the entire empire. Then the other administrators and high officers began searching for some fault in the way Daniel was handling government affairs. But they couldn't find anything to criticize or condemn. He was faithful, always responsible, and completely trustworthy. So they concluded the only chance of finding grounds for accusing Daniel will be in connection with the rules of his religion. So the new king has come in. King Darius has come in, and he quickly wants to establish his new government. Okay, these are, these are a conquered people. They're, they're used to being the ruling power in the world, and now they've been defeated. And now they have a new king, this Medo-Persian king, and he's come in. And he wants to get a handle on his new conquered citizen. So he divides up the land into 120 regions, and he appoints an official over them, like a mayor. In the original language, it says satrap. The word is satrap, which literally means governor. So they each control that part of area, like an LGA. We know what LGAs are from the lockdowns we've had. Yep, okay. We know what an LGA is. Imagine 120 LGAs. And over these 120 governors or mayors, he sets up three administrators or overseers, and they manage 40 each. So that his kingdom, the king can know and trust that his kingdom is being managed well. And so Daniel is one of these overseers. He's one of the three three in charge of managing this new kingdom. And we read, of the three, Daniel is the best. He shows the greatest capability. 
So much so that Darius wants to appoint Daniel to be the ruler over everything. Under him, Daniel will manage the affairs of this kingdom. Similar to how Joseph ran Egypt, if you remember that. So before we go any further into the life of Daniel, we've already learnt the first thing we need to know about how to be a cut above. We need to be a cut above in how we operate. We need to be a cut above in how we operate. Daniel at this point has already proved himself to be highly capable. He's an effective leader. He's an operator in the kingdom. In fact, no matter what king has sat on the throne, Daniel has always served them to the best of his ability. And now he's in a position to run a kingdom. No matter where we are in life, no matter what we do with ourselves, in our workplace, in our study, in our homes, in our retirement, in our neighborhoods, no matter what you put your hands to, you have to do it to the best of your ability. Daniel was not interested in furthering the cause of the Babylonians. Why would he? They took him captive out of his homeland. He never saw his family again. They took him to a new land and made him work for them. He's not interested in furthering their cause or the Medo-Persian cause for that matter. These kingdoms have destroyed his homeland. But Daniel still does his best. He serves wholeheartedly. Why? He's not serving Nebuchadnezzar or Belshazzar or Darius. He's serving his God. He's serving his God. No matter what the circumstance, he trusts that God is in control. No matter what is happening around him, even as a young man taken from his homeland into a new place, he trusts God is in control. I'm going to serve him until he tells me otherwise. In his operation as an administrator, he performed a cut above in every circumstance. He did his best every single day. He worked hard, and through his commitment and God's positioning, he was placed to run a kingdom. In Proverbs 13 4, it says this. It says, Lazy people want much but get little, but those who work hard will prosper. We should be the hardest working person in our workplace. We should be the most caring person in our families. We should be the best neighbor to those around us. No matter what you do, where you are, remember that you are serving God. You are his representative. And everyone he sees you sees Jesus. Everything you do is a representation of him. So let us all aim to be a cut above. Let us do our best every day. So Daniel finds himself in a position to run the country, but of course that brings negativity. He finds himself the target of the other overseers and the governors. So they start searching for fault in how he operates. They're looking for dodgy dealings, bribes, favors, corruption, anything they can find. They scour his political career 60 years. They try and find anything they can. Door knocking, paying people off. Is there anything we can find? But they can't find a thing. So what's their motivation here? Why do they care so much if Daniel was put in power? What's their problem? I've read lots of people say that they were just jealous of Daniel. They were jealous of him. He was the one getting chosen to run the country. They wanted their jobs. They're just simply jealous. And I'm sure they are jealous of Daniel. But that's not why they're worried about Daniel being in charge. I think as they went looking, they were sure they'd find something. I think they sure they'd find at least one dodgy deal in Daniel's past. Surely just one. Why? Because those overseers and those governors were guilty of dodgy dealing. They were the one extorting people. They were the one who were corrupt. They figured if we do it, surely he does it. Surely he's done something. We just need to find out what he's done. They are so worried with Daniel in charge that he will bring an end to their dishonesty. He will bring an end to their corruption, their extortion. And those worries are confirmed when they find nothing in Daniel's life. He is a good man. He is a godly man who is devout. Daniel isn't like them. And he's going to bring an end to what they're doing. So what? They have to bring him down. They have to bring him down. The second example we take from Daniel is that we must be a cut above in our conduct. We must be a cut above in our conduct. After all their investigations, what did they find? Nothing. Nothing. 
except for this. They found that Daniel was three things. Daniel was three things. He was faithful. Daniel was faithful. He was faithful to his God and he was faithful to his king. Regardless of the enemy, regardless of what they have done, he was faithful to them because God had put him there. He was faithful to his God. He was always responsible. Always responsible. And he was completely trustworthy. He was completely trustworthy. Faithful, always responsible, completely trustworthy. Shouldn't it be our goal in life that if anyone came snooping into our path, snooping into what things that we have done, all they would find is that we are faithful, completely responsible, or always responsible and completely trustworthy. Wouldn't that be great if that's all they found? Shouldn't that be our goal? As we conduct ourselves through our lives, through our days, this is not what we should just aspire to. It's what we should be doing. And I hope that we are all able to say that we are faithful, always responsible, and completely trustworthy. To be always faithful to our God. Always faithful to him. Faithful to his word. Faithful to the calling on our lives. To be that person that everyone knows is responsible. They know they can trust it. They know that if we say something, we will do something. We are faithful to our promises. And to be trustworthy. Someone people can confide in. They know if they come to us, they can trust us. And we have their best interests at heart. Fathers this morning, this is how we need to be with our children. Faithful, always responsible, completely trustworthy. So that they know, our sons and daughters when they grow up, they know what the expectation is on them. What God expects from them. How they should live their lives. Otherwise, how will they know? Unless we show them. That when they grow up and they find a family of their own, that their spouse that they choose, they know what to look for. That sons would look for wives that are faithful and always responsible, completely trustworthy. That daughters would look for husbands that are faithful, always responsible and completely trustworthy. And it starts with the dads. It starts with us in the home. Let us set the example. So they investigate Daniel, and it goes nowhere. They don't find anything. No skeletons in the closet. No mudslinging can occur. So what do they do? How do they bring Daniel down? They have to manufacture something. They've got to create something because there's nothing there. And they pick on the one thing they know about Daniel, that he is faithful to God, that he is devout. They make, they're going to get him according to the rules of his religion. Our version says, according to the laws of his God. So they attack his faith. They attack his faith. In Daniel 6, verse 6, it reads this. So administrators and the officers, half officers went to the king and said, Long live King Darius. Glad I'm able to get you everywhere, apparently. We are all in agreement. We administrators, officials, high officers, advisors and governors, anyone they could find, that the king should make a law that will be strictly enforced. Give orders that for the next 30 days, any person who prays to anyone, divine or human, except to you, your majesty, will be thrown into the lion's den of lions. And now, your majesty, issue and sign this law so it cannot be changed. An official law of the Medes and Persians that cannot be revoked. So King Darius signed the law. As a side note here, in the Medo-Persian uh, culture, once a law was signed by the king, it could not be changed, even by the king himself. Okay, It was just part of how they how they ran the legal system. Once a law was signed by the king, it could not be changed. So they come with flattery to King Darius. Live forever, live forever, King Darius. Flattery and lies. We've all agreed. Had they all agreed? Who's missing? Daniel. The other administrators were there, the other two of them. They mustered everyone they can find, but there's no Daniel. He's probably praying to his God. And so they chose a very opportune time to go visit the king when Daniel wouldn't be around. Make a law, O king, that no one can pray or worship anybody or any god except for you. I can't imagine what Darius was thinking. Okay, As a king, I guess it's nice. I guess it's nice to have, know that people are worshipping you and praising your name and praying to you, even though you can't really do much if they're praying. How, how would you know if they're praying? But King Darius thinks to himself, this is great. This is great. Maybe, I think, that King Darius was thinking that he's just conquered a new land. His people are uncertain about their future. They're in turmoil. 
well, give them something to focus on. If they pray to me for 30 days, then their focus is on that and not on the fact they've just been conquered. That's, that's the fact the Babylonians were used to praying to their kings as gods. Weren't they? Look at King Nebuchadnezzar. He put a massive statue of himself that people were going to worship. So the Babylonians knew they expected to pray to their king as a god. It wasn't new for them. So maybe he's thinking, this would be a greater. For the next 30 days, I'll just focus on worshipping me. Whatever the reason, Darius has forgotten Daniel. He doesn't even notice that Daniel is, the, is missing. He's become swept up in this idea and signs the decree. Let us read. But when Daniel learned that the law had been signed, he went home and knelt down as usual in his upstairs room with its windows open towards Jerusalem. He prayed three times a day just as he had always done, giving thanks to his God. Then the officials went together to Daniel's house and found him praying and asking for God's help. So they went straight to the king and reminded him about his law, as if he'd forgotten. It's the same day, people. Yes, the king replied, the decision stands. It is an official law of the Medes and Persians that cannot be revoked. Then they told the king, that man Daniel, one of the captives from ignoring you and your law, he still prays to God three times a day. Three times a day. He's ignoring you and your law. He still prays to his God three times a day. Daniel has prayed to God three times a day for the last 60 years, faithfully. That wasn't a secret. They knew Daniel was a prayer. They knew that he was devout. They knew what Daniel did. So what does Daniel do when he finds out? He knows as an overseer, an administrator in the government, he knows that once it was signed, his fate has been sealed. He knows it can't be changed. So he's got a choice. He doesn't pray for 30 days, like he's always done for 60 years. Or he continues to do what he's always done. He continues to be faithful to his God. What does Daniel do? The first thing he does, he goes home and he prays. He prays. He prays with the windows open like he's always done. They knew he was a man of faith, and now they're going to test it. His faith was going to be tested. They were wondering. How long will he last? Will he not pray for a week? Ten days? Daniel doesn't last the first day. Doesn't last the first few hours. As soon as he heard it was signed, he went and prayed immediately. Why? Because Daniel was faithful to his God. We are to be a cut above in our faith. We are to be a cut above in our faith. Daniel, knowing he can't do anything, does the only thing he can do. He prays. It says he prays with the window open in Jerusalem, just as he had done three times a day, every day for 60 years. Why is that important? Why is it important that his window opens towards Jerusalem in the direction of his homeland? Why is that important? Because Daniel has faith in his God. And because he has faith in God, he has faith in God's word. In First King, it says this. It says, in chapter 8, it says, If they turn to you, this is Solomon speaking. So Solomon who built the temple, who dedicated the temple to God. Solomon says, If they turn to you with their whole heart and soul in the land of their enemies and pray towards the land you gave to their ancestors, towards the city you have chosen, hear their prayer and uphold their cause. Hear their prayer and uphold their cause. Daniel knows. He believes that if he prays to God, God will hear him and uphold his cause. He knows he can do nothing according to the law. So he goes to God who can do anything. And he believes that God will uphold his cause. Despite the fact that by praying, by going home immediately and praying, he seals his faith. He is faith because he is wholehearted. He pours his soul out to God, and God hears him. God will uphold his cause because his cause is being faithful to God. The same applies to us. We can trust in God's word. We can trust in his promises. Just as Daniel took hold of the promises in 1 Kings, we can exercise faith that is a cut above because of his word. In Philippians 4, 6, it says this. It says this, do not worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. 
God wants us to pray about everything. Everything in your life is worthy of prayer. And not to worry about anything. Just like Daniel prayed knowing that he was breaking the king's decree, praying in faith in the face of death by lions, we too can pray in the face of whatever comes our way. I'm sure it's not going to be lions, okay? Most likely. But whatever happens, the burdens we carry, the situations that seem hopeless, the uncertainty of our choices, the unforeseen consequences of our decisions, tell God what you need. That's what he's telling us to do. Tell me what you need. Thank him for everything that he has done. And if you can't think of anything, remember he sent his son Jesus to die for you. And we, Every day we should be thankful that he has saved us. Get on your knees and go, thank you, God, for sending Jesus that I may live. And then tell God what you need, and God will hear you. Instead of worrying, pray. Every time you find yourself worrying, stop yourself and pray. It doesn't need to be a long prayer. It can simply be, help me, God. That's it. If you're wholehearted, God will hear you. If you're worrying, it's grace, grace. Grace, grace. I need grace. Help me, God. That's all it takes. Instead of worrying, replace your worry with prayer. Arrest yourself. Stop and go, help me, God. Help me, God. Let's have a faith that goes the extra mile. Trust a little more. Understands that God has come through before and he will come through again because he is faithful. So Daniel, as if he was channeling the Apostle Paul from the future, he prays. He tells God what he needs. He thanks God. That's like he has always done. And it's during this prayer time that what? The officials, the administrators, they come to his house. They don't come knocking. He's up in the upper room praying towards Jerusalem. They came straight into his house to catch him out. And they make it public. They make everyone know that Daniel has broken the decree. Isn't it funny how they knew what to do? As soon as it was signed, I bet you I know where they went. They went to Daniel's house and waited for him to turn up. Once they saw him dash inside, they waited till he started praying, and then they went in. Because it was their plan. That was the plan. And with the evidence, they go to the king. They remind Darius of the law that he signed the same day, okay, as if he'd forgotten. And they said, that man, Daniel, one of the captives from Judah, as if Darius doesn't know who Daniel is, like, they take this opportunity to label Daniel as the outsider. He's one of the captives. He's one of those guys from Judah. He's not one of us. He's not one of us. And then they create division. He shows no respect to you, O king, or your laws. He disregards you. But Daniel wasn't disregarding the king. He wasn't disrespecting the king. He was being faithful to his God, just like he had always done. So the truth is out. King Darius sees what has happened. And how does he react? It tells us he is deeply troubled. He's deeply troubled. What did he do? He spent the rest of the day trying to save Daniel. He was deeply troubled, greatly distressed. But I love how the, the new King James says it. He says that King Darius was greatly displeased. He was greatly displeased, not with Daniel, not with the officials, although I'm sure he was very displeased with his officials. But it says he was displeased with himself. Darius was upset at himself. Why? Because he had been conned. He knew. He had been tricked. I've been duped. They preyed on his pride and they trapped him into condemning Daniel. And it's not from Daniel we learn our fourth lesson about being a cut above. It's from Darius. We are to be a cut above in our resolution. We are to be a cut above in our resolution. And what does that mean? Darius knew he'd made a mistake. And now he found himself disappointed in what he had done and what he had allowed to happen. Disappointed, he'd been manipulated so easily. Bible commentator William Newell, he says this, to be disappointed in yourself means to have trusted yourself. Darius trusted in his own judgment. He trusted completely in his if inflated, ego-driven discernment. He took no outside counsel. 
He didn't even think to speak to his most trusted overseer, Daniel. He didn't even think to talk about it with him. He took no counsel and he got duped. So what does he do? What did he do now? He signed the law. He spends the rest of the day seeking to fix the error. He tried to remedy his mistake. Darius did everything he could to save Daniel. Everything he could to save Daniel. That's amazing. Don't forget that Darius is a king. He has just conquered Babylon. He is a king. There are lots of things he could have been doing that day, I'm sure. What's the thing that needed to be done as he sets up a new empire? But what does he do? He spends all his time and effort trying to save a captive from Judah, his administrator. Living a cut above means that we have to humbly accept when we stuff up. Living a cut above what we must humbly admit when we are wrong. If we make a mistake, we must go above and beyond in finding a resolution. That is what living a cut above means. We must do everything we can to fix what we have done. Not ignoring our fault, but resolving the situation that we have created. That is what people of God, that's what men, that's what dads who follow God do. They fix their mistakes. They take care of the errors that they make. And just like Darius, we don't quit until we've done everything we can. Darius was so fervent in his trying to save Daniel. Why? Because in Medo-Persian culture, if you're sentenced to death, the sentence was carried out on the same day. Okay? Nowadays, if, if someone's put on death row, it could take time before they're executed. But in this culture, if you are found guilty of a capital crime, you're executed the same day. So Darius only had the remainder of the day to do everything he could. And so he fixates all his energy and time to try and save Daniel. So what happens next? In the evening, the men went together to the king. So all the day, Daniel Darius has been trying to save. And these officials know that Darius has tried to save Daniel. And they said, Your Majesty, you know that according to the law of Medes and Persians, no, no law that the king signs can be changed. So at last the king gave orders for Daniel to be arrested and thrown into the den of lions. And the king said to him, May your God whom you serve so faithfully rescue you. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den. The king sealed the stone with his own royal seal and the seals of his nobles so that no one could rescue Daniel. Knowing he's done everything he can, knowing that he can do nothing, after being so bluntly reminded by the other officials that you can't do anything, king, he surrenders to his duty and he orders Daniel arrested. And Daniel is thrown into the den. Now Darius can do no more. The den is sealed and he leaves Daniel's fate into the hands of the only one who can do anything, the God whom Daniel serves so faithfully. He sealed Daniel to his fate and Darius retires. And he goes and parties all night. No. No, he doesn't party all night. No, he doesn't. Then the king returned to his palace and spent the night fasting. He refused his usual entertainment and could not sleep at all that night. Darius goes and refuses all the entertainment a king would usually have. And he fasts. We are to be a cut above in our dedication. We had to be a cut above in our dedication. Darius goes to his chambers, not knowing if Daniel will survive, hoping beyond hope, exerting what little faith he has in the God of Daniel, that his beloved administrator will somehow see out the night. But Darius doesn't just mope around his room. He doesn't drown his sorrows with wine. He doesn't pity eat his weight through his worries. Despite failing in his ability as king to save Daniel, he dedicates himself to his beliefs that maybe, just maybe, this God of Daniel's can save him. Just maybe. And so Darius spends the whole night fasting. I don't know what role fasting had in the Medo-Persian culture. I don't know. Okay? But obviously it was something that, that Darius knew what to do. Obviously it was part of their culture somehow. In the Old Testament, for God's people, fasting was when you dedicate yourself to draw nearer to God and ask, for his intervention. The prophets would warn and the people go into fasting to 
and try and get God to intervene and save them. We see this in the book of Joel. In Joel 2, it says this, that the prophet Joel comes with a warning that invasion is coming, disaster is coming. And so what does Joel say to him? He says this, he says, Blow the ram's horn in Jerusalem. Announce a time of fasting. Call the people together for a solemn meeting. And so the prophet Joel, whose dad is here today, thank you, Jose. Excellent, that's my second dad joke for the morning. God warns, God's people are warned to commit to fasting in order to avoid the disaster that was coming. And here we see Darius fasting, trying to avoid the disaster coming towards Daniel. He's unable to sleep. He's up all night trying to intercede for Daniel, even though he has no idea if what he's doing will even accomplish anything. He still does it anyway. He has no idea if his customs can somehow convince a foreign god to save his child. Daniel, the child of God. What I love is Darius's dedication. Committing himself to this cause, holding on to nothing but faith that Daniel can somehow escape the lion's mouth. We can all use a little bit of that dedication, couldn't we? Not even knowing if what he's going to do is going to change anything. He does it anyway. That is dedication that is a cut above. Commitment that is absolute. Giving all for a cause we believe in. Even when you're tired. Even though we don't know if it's going to make a difference. Even when things seem hopeless. Commit and dedicate yourself. And God just may use you to do great things. God just may do something. You will witness something amazing happening that is miraculous. And so now we come to the miraculous. Darius had a sleepless night. But what about Daniel? Very early in the morning, the king got up and hurried out to the lion's den. When he got there, he called out in anguish, Daniel, servant of the living God, was your God whom you served so faithfully able to rescue you from the lions? Daniel answered, Long live the king. My God sent his angels to shut the lion's mouth so that they would not hurt me. For I have been found innocent in his sight and have not wronged you your majesty. The king was overjoyed and ordered Daniel to be lifted from the den. Not a scratch was found on him, for he had trusted in his God. Darius rushes to the lion's den. He's been awake all night. Once he saw the sun pick over the horizon, he was off. He ran down to see if Daniel was alive. And once he get there, I love what he says even before he knows. He says, Daniel, servant of the living God. The night before, he was just wishing that, God, that Daniel's God would save him. But in the morning, he's like, this is the living God. His faith is increased as he's fasted all night. I'm sure he's been praying all night as well. And he refers to God as the living God. He looks into the den. Cries out in English, Daniel, are you there? Daniel, wanting to believe. And Daniel answers the king. And he gives God the glory. He thanks God for his rescue. But he also shows respect to the king. That even though the, those, those officials accused Daniel of disrespecting the king, of disregarding him, that he ignored the king, Darius now knows that Daniel did nothing wrong. This Daniel would never disrespect him because he is a man of God. He knows that Daniel has not wronged him. So we are to be a cut above in our example. I cut above in the example. Both Daniel and Darius show us the importance of setting the example for others. Darius rushes down in the hope that Daniel is alive. That's not very regal behavior, is it, of a king? Everyone would have seen him rushing to see if Daniel was there. His concern for Daniel is so evident. But he didn't care. He didn't care what the people thought. He didn't care what the other officials thought. He only cared that Daniel was alive. That's his only concern. And when he gets there, he acknowledges a foreign God is living and powerful and he is overjoyed. But Darius' reaction is to Daniel's faithfulness. His faith in this foreign God is born out of the fact that Daniel has been faithful for so long. Once Daniel was lowered into the den, he would have seen that God had intervened. The lions weren't interested in him. And I bet you once he knew that, he slept a whole lot better in that lion's den than Darius did in his king's chambers. 
eventually Daniel slept really well because he knew that God had saved him. So when he comes out, it's not with great relief, kissing the ground, oh, dodge the bullet there. His first response is what? To alleviate Darius's anxiety. He shows due respect. Long live the king. And Darius knows that Daniel is alive and Daniel cares about him. Both men set a great example in that they are each concerned with the other's welfare before their own. But it's Daniel's faithfulness to God that was a seed of faith in Darius. His commitment to his faith shows Darius that our God is the only one that can be trusted. Our God is the only one that is real. Our God is the only one who is living and powerful and able to save. The only one that truly loves his children. That is the power of an example of faith that is a cut above. It inspires faith in other people. And as a father, I hope that I can inspire my girls to have faith in their God. And now the two men meet. There's not a scratch on Daniel. And the credit is given to God and those who have faith in him. So lastly, we learn that when we are a cut above, God gets the glory. God gets the glory when we live a cut above. In Daniel 26, Daniel 6, verse 26, it says this. This is Darius. I decree that everyone throughout my kingdom should tremble with fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and he will endure forever. His kingdom will never be destroyed. His rule will never end. Darius, the Medo-Persian king, exalts the God of Israel, exalts our God because of what he's seen. The outcome of living a life that is a cut above, God is glorified. God is seen through our example and God can be known by those that we love. Our children, our family, our friends, our colleagues, our neighbours, they see through us that God loves them. They see through us who Jesus is. They all benefit when we live a life that is our best. They get our best and then they get to see a God who loves them. A God who wants them to live the best life. A life that is a cut above. Just existing. A cut above just getting through the day. Just getting through the week. Just getting through the month. It is a life that knows love. That understands love. Experiences love. And shares in his goodness. Let us pray this morning, church. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you and we exalt you and we praise your holy name. Because you are the God who saves. You are the true and only living God. Lord, help us to be as devout and as faithful as Daniel is. Sixty plus years, praying every day, three times a day, giving thanks and trusting in your provision. Even though he was in a foreign land, serving foreign rulers, plucked from his home, never to see his family again. He trusted in you because he knew that you were in control. Let us have the faith of Daniel. Lord, I pray for everyone here, everyone here, that they would serve and they would live a life that is a cut above, that they would live a cut above in their faith, in their devotion, in their resolution, a cut above in their conduct. I know that if they live their best life, you are glorified. And those who they love, those who they care for, those who they influence, will see and understand who you are, God. They will see you through us. Lord, I pray for those here this morning, those watching online this morning, who do not know you. Lord, I pray that they would understand that you have a life for them. A life that goes beyond just making it through the day. A life that goes beyond survival eking out an existence, getting through the day, the week, the month, that they would know there is a life of abundance waiting for them if they would call on the name of Jesus and make him Lord of their life. That you have so much for them. You have a life that is beyond anything they could possibly hope or imagine because you love them, because you sent your son Jesus to die for them, to take away their sin so they may live a life in your presence. Lord, I pray for anyone out there that they would come to you and they would cry out to Jesus and say, Lord, save me. Lord, save me. I want to live for you. I want a life of abundance. I want a life 
that is with my Creator. Lord, I pray for all the dads here this morning, all the men in this church, that they would dedicate themselves to living a life that is a cut above, setting the example for those around them, just as Daniel and Darius set for us, knowing that you can use anyone, God. You used a foreign king, this Medo-Persian king. You used him in this account that they gave glory to yourself. You can use anyone, God. Everyone here, if they are faithful to you, you can use them to do amazingly powerful, miraculous things. Let us never give up. Let us never stop. Let us always strive to live our best life for you, God, because you love us. And you want us to live the best life we can. We thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Thank you, church, for coming this wonderful Father's Day. A couple of things before we leave. I want to say thank you to everyone joining us online. I pray you have a blessed... For the dads out there, I hope you had a great day so far and you have a great day for the rest of the day. God bless you and have a great week.